Welcome, students, to the latest installment in Chapter 9's discussion of the shape or geometry of molecules. Before beginning, in typical fashion, I wanted to start by sharing with you a couple of humorous chemistry cats from quickmeme.com. In this one, it says, tell a potassium joke. Okay? And in this one, it says, do I know any jokes about sodium? Nah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Speaking of hilarious, I also wanted to give you guys the opportunity to see a couple of different videos of a cool and popular chemistry demonstration. You see, there exists a chemistry demonstration that's often done that's very popular called elephant's toothpaste, which features the following chemical reaction, the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide to form uh, water and oxygen gas. When you watch this demonstration, uh, as shown in two links that I've posted here that you can also click on to open and watch in separate tabs, uh, it's catalyzed by potassium iodide, or Ki, but the reason that it foams is because of the vigorous production of oxygen gas. The O2 gas is what causes it to actually bubble. When you add food coloring and soap, it ends up uh, making it look very visually cool. Here are the HTMLs, and like I say, you've got these links here that you can click to watch them. And by the way, I counsel you not to try this at home. With that said, let's continue our discussion on the geometry of molecules. Uh, I wanted to first of all let you guys know, and I've talked about this before, that once you get down to row three of the periodic table and below, uh, atoms at that point can actually be sound, uh, surrounded by more than four electron pairs. In other words, they can have more than a full octet. The reason primarily is because those atoms have d orbitals, some of which on row three, for example, sometimes are not occupied by electrons. So once again, don't freak out when you come across atoms from row three or below that have more than eight electrons around them in certain molecules. The beautiful thing about it is that it creates some very elegant and fascinating molecular geometries that are a little different from the ones that, I'm, uh, that are shown in tables 9.1 and 9.2 in our text, which I'll show to you in this lecture. Here's table 9.1. If, for instance, you've got a, some type of molecule that has a central atom bonded to only two things on either side of it, then according to Vesper theory, or Vesper theory, it's going to want to put those two things as far apart from each other, geometrically speaking, as possible. That is going to give you a nice straight line with a 180 degree bond separation. The name of that geometry is linear. In contrast, if you've got a central atom that has three things around it, the bond angle is going to be 120 between each of these, in theory. The name of this shape, or geometry, is trigonal planar, and the reason it be is because it looks like a triangle with each of the three vertices in that triangle being in a plane, a trigonal or triangular plane. In this type of molecule that we discussed in an earlier video, you have a central atom that's bonded to four different things around it, which could either be atoms, other appendages, or sets of lone pairs. If we count each of those things in the geometry, they're going to want to spread out 109.5 degrees apart from each other, giving us this geometry that we call tetrahedral. Now, when we deal with some of the stranger elements down further on the periodic table that can have more than eight electrons around them, one of those circumstances might be having five things around it. If I have a central atom that has five different appendages around it, or sets of lone pairs, they're going to try and spread out uh, to be separated by 120 degree bond angle, just like a trigonal plane here in this plane, with a lobe up top or a group up top and a group down bottom being perpendicular to that plane by 90 degrees. The name of this geometry is called trigonal bipyramid. Here's the reason. If you draw a line from each of these groups, one group to the next, and consider it a vertex, each of these vertices make a shape that looks like a pyramid with a triangle as a base, as opposed to a square base like the pyramids in Egypt. I have a pyramid up top with a triangular base and another pyramid down bottom with the same triangular base. So I have two pyramids, each with a trigonal or triangular base. That's why we call this shape trigonal bipyramid. Now, if you've got an element that can have six different appendages around it, each of those is going to separate out in a completely perpendicular 90 degree bond difference to give you this geometry, which we call octahedral. I'm going to show you some of these more exotic uh, geometries later on in greater detail, but I'd like to first start out by showing you a couple of simple pictures of examples. This is an example molecule, carbon dioxide. As you can see, you've got a central carbon atom bonded to two oxygens on either sides. No lone pairs on that central carbon atom. Therefore, it's going to have a linear geometry separated by 180 degrees between these two oxygen atoms. In SO2, or sulfur dioxide, you've got a set of lone pairs on the sulfur atom up here, which are not pictured. If we don't consider those lone pairs in the molecule's geometry and just sort of put our hands over them and only look at the atoms going from oxygen to sulfur to oxygen, this is a geometry that is bent 
with a 120 degree bond angle sep uh, separating those two oxygens. Now in SO3, I don't have a set of lone pairs as I do in SO2 on the sulfur. It's bonded to three different oxygens, all separated by 120 degree bond angle. That is a trigonal planar geometry. In nitrogen trifluoride, in contrast, I do have a set of lone pairs up on this nitrogen that are not shown. If I mask those lone pairs and only consider all of the atoms in the geometry, you'll notice that this is a trigonal pyramid. The reason is because I've got a point at the top, and it goes like a pyramid to each of these vertices, and each of these atoms, or these vertices at the bottom, form a triangular or trigonal base. So this is a trigonal pyramid. In this last most exotic molecule from this lineup, chlorine trifluoride, the chlorine atom actually has, in addition to being bonded to each of the fluorine atoms, three sets of lone pairs that are not shown. Now, if you were counting the lone pairs and considering them as contributing to the overall geometry of this molecule, this molecule's geometry would be octahedral, as I showed in the previous slide. If you're ignoring or masking those lone pairs and only looking at the chlorine and fluorine atoms, the name of this geometry is T-shaped with 90 degree angles separating each of these fluorines. Now I have to teach you some geometry vocabulary. Our book, just so you know, happens to call lone electron pairs non-bonding pairs or sometimes just lone pairs. Now that contrasts with electrons that are being shared between two atoms. If I have electrons that are being shared by two atoms, those are called bonding pairs. So the number of things around a central atom, which, and when I say things, I mean either groups or lone pairs or whatever. The number of things that are around that central atom happen to be called the atom's number of electron domains. So do you have those few vocabulary terms down? If not, pause this uh, video and look at these terms until you've got them all down, because it will become relevant later on. Now, as I foreshadowed in a previous video, for molecules that have lone electron pairs, which are once again called non-bonding pairs in our book, you can create two different shapes or molecular geometries. One that counts the lone pairs and one that doesn't count them. The geometry that counts lone pairs in its overall shape is called electron domain geometry. And geometries that don't count lone pairs in the overall shape are called molecular geometries. Let's take a look then at some examples. If I have a molecule in which I've got a central atom bonded to two different things, and those things are both atoms, so there are no lone pairs on that, I would say that the number of bonding domains in that molecule is two. The number of non-bonding domains, or lone pairs in this example, is zero. The molecular geometry, of course, is linear, and an example of this is carbon dioxide that we saw earlier. Let's compare that to an example where I have a central atom bonded to three separate things. If all of those three separate things are things that are actually sharing electrons, that is, other atoms or groups that are bonded to the central atom, then I would say the number of bonding domains is three, the number of non-bonding domains, or lone pair electrons, is zero and the molecular geometry is trigonal planar. An example of this is boron trifluoride. However, if I had an example like this where one of these groups was a set of lone pairs and the other two groups were other atoms, then the number of bonding domains would be two. The number of non-bonding domains, which once again is just the number of lone pair electrons, is one. And the overall molecular geometry, that is the geometry in which we don't count the lone pairs, would be bent. An example of this is nitrogen dioxide, as shown here. I have a set of lone pairs on that nitrogen. The rough angle between each of these groups, including lone pairs, is around 120 or close to it. But the overall molecular geometry is bent. Tetrahedral has a wide variety of different shapes. If all of these groups are different atoms that are bonded to the central atom, I've got four bonding domains, zero lone pair electrons, and the shape is called tetrahedral. An example is methane, shown right here. In comparison, if one of these were a set of lone pairs, then I would say I have one non-bonding domain, which is once again one set of lone pairs, three bonding domains, and the molecular geometry, the one in which I cover up this set of lone pairs and completely ignore it and only look at what's remaining, is trigonal pyramid. And you can see a beautiful triangle going up to a vertex up top. It's a beautiful pyramid. An example of this would be the molecule ammonia, shown here. Now you can compare that with the circumstance in which I have two sets of lone pairs on this central atom. That is, I've got two non-bonding domains and two bonding domains. This example would be water, H2O. 
the molecular geometry, once again, the one in which I completely ignore the two sets of lone pair electrons when considering the shape of this molecule, would be called bent. Now things get much more exotic when we start talking about those hypervalent molecules, ones in which I've got more than an octet around the central atom. I'm not going to read all of them to you, but we'll just advise you to pause the video here if needed and look at each of these individual molecular geometries and examples and make sure that you understand what non-bonding domains and bonding domains actually mean. These are different examples of trigonal bipyramid and octahedral molecules. This takes us then to a beautiful problem for water, H2O. Please determine the following. It's electron domain geometry. That is the geometry or shape in which we count everything, including lone pair electrons on that central atom. The molecule's molecular geometry, in which we only count atoms as contributing to the shape and ignore the lone pairs. And third, the molecule's number of electron domains. I'm not going to show you the answer to this problem here, but we'll invite you to pause this and look back a couple of slides that I just showed you and see if you can figure out the answer on your own. And more importantly, make sure that you understand why the answer is what it is. Now, using the water molecule as an example, explain the difference between electron domain geometry and molecular geometry. This takes us now to a beautiful lecture problem which I ask you to draw the Lewis structure for each of the following molecules or ions and indicate separately each of their electron domain and molecular geometries. I'm not going to do this problem here. I invite you to pause the video on your own and see if you can figure it out yourself. But I will post a link to a separate video in which I do answer a few of these examples.